I, I do not know. So I'm not sure who, so I, well, we see a space. I don't know. Yeah. It looks like you might have your slider over your camera. Well, continue the meeting where I figure out, figure it out. Okay. Um, Allegra, if you could just check in to go around and make sure everybody could be here, can hear okay. and can be heard, that would be great. All right. Um... Jen, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, Philip, can you say something? Yep, I can hear Great. you. Great, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Earl? Hello. Hello. Um, Pamela? Hello. Hello. Dr. Fricke? Can you um, unmute and just make sure we can hear you? Hi. Hi, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Deborah? Hi. Hello, Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Yep. Wonderful. D. Hello. Hello. And you can hear us? Yep. Okay. And Miss Pat? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Um, Does anybody have any announcements? Is that what I'm supposed to do first? Just making sure. Yes, that's that's fine. <laughs> okay. And we're gonna follow the um, the posted agenda. Correct. So the meeting um, should start now. You just call the meeting to order, and we know the time. Um, so it is 606 and I'm calling the meeting officially to order. Thank you. Do I need to put the agenda up on the screen? That sometimes, helpful. yeah, or yes. Jennifer, might you put the um, agenda on the screen or we can, it doesn't matter. Would you like for me to do that, Allegra, or, or do you have it ready? I do not have it ready. I'm I have sorry. it ready. I can put it on the screen for the review. Okay, thank you. This is historic. Uh, so can you see it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can so, you make it a little bit bigger, Jennifer? Thanks. So we will start the meeting approving the minutes from last meeting. We'll have a public comment period, any member reports, and then we will welcome Ms. Pamela, Dr. Pamela Young, our new diversity equity inclusion director. We will review the APD video that is from July 5th of this year. And then we'll review the CSWG seven gen and leap reports that were in our packets. Talk about the web page, the implementation team report, the org chart, and then get updates <coughs> from CRESS, um, DEI, and I'm assuming, yep, the Resident Oversight Board, Translation Services, and then the Youth Empowerment Center and BIPOC Multicultural Center. Then we will think about upcoming agenda items and meeting schedules and any other topics that we did not foresee. Does anybody have any questions about the agenda? So we should approve the minutes, Allegra. Does anyone have any uh, comments or changes to the minutes from the last meeting? Were folks able to read them? I did see Jennifer had posted if we weren't able to read it to uh, table it, but I was able to read the minutes. Was everyone else who attended that meeting able to read the minutes? I read it. Okay. Yeah, we can just, yeah, if, if folks are good, we can just adopt it or whatever. Yeah, my motion to approve the last meeting's minutes. Thank you. So anyone second, second it? it? 
I second it. Okay. Deborah seconds. And do we take a formal vote then? Yes. All right. Um, by voice vote. Um, and I will call on you, D. Yes. Approved. Deborah. Approved. Ms. Pat. Yes. Philip. Yes. And Freke. Yes. And I am a yes. So that had the minutes pass. Um, six so moved. Voting yes and zero voting no. Yeah, so moved. So all in favor. Okay. Now we move to public comment. Okay. And there's something else I get to read from this agenda. <laughs> um, sorry, bear with me. This is my first time with all these official things. You're doing um, you're, you're doing, doing great. Yeah, you're doing great. Okay. During we go with the, the flow, we go with the flow. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much less formal than these things are, so I'm, I'm trying my hardest. Um, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address or area where you live. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based on the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The CSSJC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during the public comment period. Um, Allegra, if you would like, I can let Dr. Paula in who has her hand raised. Yes, please. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. OK, great. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say uh, I'm here with great consternation. I am the executive director of YSET Academy in Springfield, Massachusetts. And we were uh, called, invited, and um, consulted with to help Amherst get through some very serious issues as it pertains to the youth, um, BIPOC people, and the relationship between those two and the police. We uh, came on board to make sure that we were able to help secure a grant for Amherst, which paved the way for crest to be birthed. Now, um, with the sadness of what's been going on with the youth being accosted by the police, we witnessed uh, or watched Channel 40 responding to what's going on in Amherst. We saw Paul Bokelman, the, the manager for Amherst, get on the video to say that the situation with press uh, is that it is purposed to respond to such matters, which is great. But he also said that, you know, press is still in training. And we, uh, when we got on board with Amherst, working directly with the town of Amherst, we did trainings, we attended uh, mandatory meetings, we witnessed two directors resign from CRESS or from the town, I beg your pardon, because they were uh, hired to be a part of CRESS. One, the first one, Wilson Darman, he uh, resigned within weeks. And another one, um, Abdallah, he, he too resigned. And the reason why I'm drawing reference to those two is because uh, there have been some frustrations in moving this BIPOC youth community initiative forward. Now, as a Black woman heading this organization, YSET, which I referred to earlier, uh, I have to say, again, I'm, I, I'm even having a hard time speak before you because the treatment that we received from the town, I can uh, say to you that it is very concerning 
the town is even in breach of the contract that it signed with us. They haven't even paid us the monies that are due to us. So that showed us that how much value does Amherst put into this work? How much do they really want to move the agenda forward? And what I mean by agenda is how much do they want those youth that are out there doing nothing to get engaged into um, fruitful after school programming, even to get into vocational training? How much does the town of Amherst really want to invest and keep their word with regards to the disenfranchised families, the homeless? How much? And the reason I have to say how much a few times is because if the town of Amherst is genuine in wanting to move this agenda forward and the agenda is to help those who can't help themselves, to put forth initiatives that's gonna really impact the lives of those who can't do it for themselves. If the town of Amherst Paul Bokelman, if he really wanted to move this forward, then I have to say, I question, and I want to know how he intended to do that when we, our services were used and contract breached. And that's what's bringing me here now. I really want to understand if what he intends to do is to help move things forward, then why is it that I stand before you as I am standing, telling you that he has breached a contract with a BIPOC organization that was called in to do that very same thing, which was to help prevent what happened with the police. We were caused, we were, we were summoned to help prevent that from happening. So I'm gonna yield, but I hope you can hear the anger and the disappointment. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Paula. Um, just Thank so you. that everyone watching knows there are nine attendees in the audience. Um, I don't see anybody else with hands up at this time. Oh, I see Russ Vernon Jones has his hand up. Um, if here he is. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I wasn't able to be at a previous meeting, and I just wanted to um, <clears throat> welcome Dr. Young uh, and express my enthusiasm and deep appreciation to each of you for agreeing to serve on this committee. Uh, I think it's a tremendously important committee, and as a member of the Community Safety Working Group that helped recommend its creation. I'm so pleased that uh, each of you has agreed to serve and um, just want to mostly to thank you. Um, and I understand you have a structure of meeting to, to stick to, but uh, when you get to Resident Oversight Board, uh, if you want to invite more comment, uh, or I can just offer myself as someone who's uh, did quite a bit of work on that proposal, and I could talk with you individually or at another time. So, thank you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Anyone else would, uh, would like to speak? No other hands up. All right. Do any members have reports on any matters that they would like to share with the committee? That won't be discussed within the agenda. That won't be discussed within the agenda. Nope. Um, so the first item is to welcome Dr. Pamela Young who is the new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, should we go around and introduce ourselves? Would that be helpful to you? 
Uh, thank you. I would welcome that. Okay. And would you like to start? Sure. So uh, as you know, I'm Pamela Nolan Young. Um, and I appreciate the PhD, but I have a JD and I generally don't use the term doctor. So Pamela Nolan Young is fine. Um, or Pamela, I am really pleased to be joining you all this evening and really to be joining the town of Amherst and the work that uh, that you've uh, created this path for really making Amherst a, a very inclusive and welcoming community. And I'm excited uh, about the challenges that lie ahead. Um, I think everyone's had an opportunity to have uh, a, a peek at my background. So unless you have a specific question, I won't take up a lot of time with that, but I am excited to join you and um, engage with you in the work that we have ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to pass it first to the two members who are on the community safety working group to introduce themselves. So um, Deborah. Hello, Pamela, how are you? I know we our paths have crossed in the past um, because um, you know, in my role in previously as a chief diversity officer for uh, UMass and head of equal opportunity diversity, I know we had done some work years ago, right? <laughs> so it's glad, um, I was very glad to see that you were back and obviously in this position. Um, so as uh, Allegra uh, stated, I was on, uh, what, oh, I'm still, you know, I mean, even though we've been disbanded, but we're still a group, community um, uh, safety working group. And we were the ones that did the work for over a year to really kind of bring together a lot of recommendations and um, creating CRESS and also creating the um, DEI department. So we're very excited that obviously your department has been created and that you and Jennifer are there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and that obviously Cress has also uh, been created with Earl and, and the other responders. Um, you know, for me, I'm, you know, resident of, of Amherst for, at this point, um, 24 years plus at this point, if I put together my uh, bachelor's uh, at UMass. Um, and so I have two kids, um, you know, black uh, boys and black men, one is 18, another one's 12. So this is very dear to me right, in terms of making sure that Amherst is a safe place for everyone. And when I say everyone, it means um, the BIPOC uh, community, our BIPOC youth. Um, and I wanna make sure that, you know, we are, you know, pushing Amherst to be all that it can be in terms of a potential of being anti-racist and to be inclusive for all, you know, regardless of background, regardless of whether they do not speak English, if it's English as a second language, uh, immigration status, it doesn't matter. We're here to be inclusive. So for me, what I want to say to you is that, you know, of course, this work is very dear to me. And, and that's why I've, I, you know, even though it costs a lot to me in terms of everything that I have going on in my life, but I said, I'm still going to take part in this group because it means a lot. And so for me, for you, and as well as for CRAS, we want to make sure that we give you all the support, right? So that means really good communication. And I want you and Earl and, and, and folks in these two departments to really know that you all need to push the, 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 the town. <laughs> You're here to really push the town. It's not gonna be status quo. It's not gonna be you know, business as usual. It's really to change things up you know, and make sure that, because as we see, right? And I know we're gonna be talking about the video and other things, things are happening on a daily basis still. You know, uh, uh, BIPOC lives are being taken and being threatened, are being hurt. Um, and again, you know, it, it can be that every time we have an interaction with the police or, 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 or other agencies within the town, that we are afraid. That can't be the case, okay? So uh, welcome, welcome, uh, utilize us. Um, that's why we're here. Um, and obviously very excited about you and uh, Cress being, you know, up and running. I guess I'm next to speak. Um, my name is Pat Ananibaku. Welcome, Dr. Pamala. Um, I'm originally from Nigeria and I'm very formal. So sometimes I will call you doctor. It's a sign of respect in my culture. I've lived in Amherst for 38 years, almost 40. I'm a grandmother, a mom, foster parent. And this is an exciting time um, with the two departments. And we're here to support both you and 
uh, Mr. Uh, and I don't want to repeat everything that um, Deborah had mentioned, but I echo everything she said. I am part of the, I was part of CSWG and I, I actually came up with the two departments like crazy one day in our meeting, people can go back. I just came up with that and we floated with it and you know, it sunk in. So I'm so glad it's an exciting time. I'm repeating myself that we have a lot of work to do. Not much has changed. I'll tell you what have changed here. It's uh, show these basically uh, attending June 10th celebration, photo up, you know, it has changed acting like, you know, we're making some progress, but we have a lot of work to do. And um, we're here to support both of you. So welcome. Our mess can be better. It's not too bad, but it can be better. And we all have taken it to, to make it. It will not be just for both of you alone, but we're here collectively to make it work for everyone, especially people of color, BIPOC and marginalized folks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. D. Shabazz, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thank you, welcome, uh, Pamela. Uh, to our group here, uh, welcome to Amherst. Uh, as uh, Deborah and Ms. Pat have shared, we are doing this to make Amherst better because we care for our community. I've been here 15 years. I have two uh, sons, uh, two children who grew up here one who is 28 now and one that is 17. They identify as African-American. So that makes them vulnerable. And first and foremost, I want a safe place for them. And I want a safe place for my friends and family who are here. And that is why I'm committed to this work I was brought on uh, contractually to assist the CSWG early on in their research around alternatives to policing and what a DEI position might look like. And we looked at other towns and municipalities and studied them. And so certainly you, <laughs> I had in mind someone like you and with your background. And so I am thankful that they have found you. And of course, we are here to support you and your work and support Earl and his work to make this town better. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you again for being here and working with us. Dr. Freke Ete. Um, hello, Dr. Young. Um, my name is Freke Ete, originally from Nigeria, uh, and for the past two years was teaching at Amherst College. Um, during that time, I considered myself a uh, resident as well of Amherst College, and uh, I'm interested in what diversity can bring to this town. Thank you. Philip Avila. Hello, Pamela. Uh, you met me last week at my day job for the Amherst Survival Center. And so that's uh, what I do in the community around here. I'm also part of this um, committee and as well as the Human Rights Commission for the town. And this work is very dear to me as well. I have a son who identifies as Latinx and he is going into sixth grade at Port River and so definitely welcome to our town. Um, Earl, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? 
Uh, me and Pamela have gotten to hang out a little bit. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, I didn't quite realize how lonely I was. Uh, for three months, I was kind of the only person working in between our two, me and Jennifer, but Jennifer had another, another job then. So uh, along with the responders, you being here has really made life uh, easier. And, and I appreciate your presence here. And, and I know we got a long way to go, but I'm glad to go with you. And Jennifer, I imagine you have already introduced yourself to Pamela, but if you'd like to say anything. Um, hello, Pamela. I'm extremely honored to be able to work underneath your leadership, and I can't wait for us to get to work to make Amherst a better place. Um, and I guess me. Um, I'm Allegra Clark. I am a resident of Amherst, and I did graduate from the high school a few years ago, well, more than I'll say, um, but I did return back to the area a few years ago. And, you know, I just, I'm a social worker by trade and I just wanted to get re-involved with the community that I kind of grew up in. And I, I'm also a member of the Affordable Housing Trust in Amherst. Um, and my background in social work has been in both homelessness and substance use issues primarily. So I, I figured those are both communities that are negatively impacted by policing. And that's one of, one of the reasons that I got involved in this particular work. So again. Well, thank you all for the warm welcome. And as we um, get into the discussions around our action items, you'll see that Jennifer and I have already started to think about some of the work that we're gonna do together. So I'm really pleased and honored to have the position and look forward to working um, with you on these issues. So. Again, welcome. We're excited to have you here. Um, so the next item on our agenda is the APD Facebook video. Um, has everybody had a chance to view the video that we're referencing? Yes, and it was just on Mass Live, a story um, featuring the, the video at six o'clock. Oh, okay. I did not see that. Uh, I haven't seen it. So you have not seen it, uh, Dr. Fricke? No. Okay, so um, is it in the packet? A link is in the packet, isn't it, Jennifer? Oh, you're muted. I sent it out to you all separately, but if you give me a moment, I can pull it up. Okay. Okay. I, I think, think it's, could, yeah, it's important. Me. Good. Is it possible to play the um, video? Yes, I believe um, Jenna is looking for it right now to pull it up. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of like, while we're looking for the video, one of the things that I just want us to ponder, right, while, while we're watching the video, because I've already watched it, and of course, I've given a lot of deep thought to this, but one of the things that I just wanted us to think about is just like, you know, the response from the town, or for me, the lack thereof of response Absolutely. from the town. So um, that's one of the issues that's concerning me, and, and hopefully after we watch the video that we can discuss. You know, one of the things that I want this town to always uh, keep in mind besides the, the phrase of, of looking through the lens of BIPOC people when policies and procedures are created and carried out is that these are our children. It's not just, you know, my child. Or you. These are our youth. And what effect and impact these types of interactions will have on the future and how it will shape these youth and their understanding of not only police, but of the world. And that's what we're giving them. That's what we're giving them. Besides the repeated message from our police that we pay as taxpayers, that you have no rights. You lost your rights. You don't lose your rights or, or gain them at adulthood at 21. They have rights. 
shocking, absolutely shocking. Okay, so I um, have found the video and I'm going to share screen. Let me share sound. All right, thank you, Jen. Can you see the video? Yes. You, can you make it larger? There you go. I think. Why do I not have All right. You've lost it. You're not an adult. You have an idea? Why do I? Do you have an idea? Can you rewind it again, uh, Jennifer, from the beginning? I you, you have, dude, I, I don't need to hear that you have your rights. Because right now, as a juvenile, you don't have right. rights at this point. You, you've lost it. Why do I not have All right? Me. You've lost it. You're not an adult. Mm. You have an ID? Why do I? Do you have an ID? No. no. Do you have a school ID? School ID works. You got school ID? Only guy do have a legal You don't get to make a call right now because you said so, because you're detained. Because you can't be out right now. Can you repeat that again? You said we don't have rights. No. Why am I, no, right. no, but why am I being detained? Dude, we've already talking told you. to you about the noise. I mean, wouldn't I do yourself? Now, you're, you're 16 years old. Okay. I'm, I have, I listen, have five you have, guys, I'm waiting for hey, AAA to come listen to me. And, and help me. Do you want to know? They're here. Do you want the answer? Yeah. You're going to keep talking over me. I'm, 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 he asked me what I'm doing. Okay. I'm telling him I have five In Amherst. Times. There are bylaws. Okay. You have five times. Okay. There are bylaws for noise. Okay. okay. Listen to me. Okay. Listen to me. So I just want to like add um, to, to what D, D, what you were, you were saying um, just a second ago. I mean, this is only like not even a minute and, and how shocking, right? You use that word, how shocking it was. So I can only imagine what else was said and how else they um, interacted with our young people. And like D said, this is our, our young people, you know, in Amherst, we have to see all the young people as our young people. And this is how they act saying, you know, you have no rights. I mean, what, what is that about, you know, in terms of the power and just exerting the power and just saying that, you know, that they can do whatever they want to them. Is that what they're saying? No, no conversation about calling the parents, no nothing, because he said it, they, they were minors. So what about calling the parents and getting the parents involved and, and that sort of thing? I mean, just, you know, out of control. And, and like I said, I mean, I, I've seen what Paul Bachman, the, the message he sent out, but that's not, that's nothing. I'm sorry, that's nothing. Just to say that, well, Crest is in training and therefore, you know what, then we're gonna, for the next eight weeks, we're gonna then just be, be dealing with this on a daily basis and that's okay. What about, you know, talking about the police and what they did and reprimanding them publicly? What, wouldn't that be something to, to say right off the bat? The minimum, the minimum, just based on that 54 second uh, video. And so reprimand the police for their behavior and then say, yes, and we're gonna do an investigation, a thorough investigation and continue forward with that. But instead it's the, oh yeah, we've been doing a lot. There's still work to be done and crashes in training. What? No. What happened to our all part B and CSWG that we talked about dealing with the police because we knew that the police were still going to be there, right? So nothing has been done, no training, no, no presentation, no nothing. It's just business as usual until Chris gets trained and, you know, Pamela gets up and running and things like that. And then we're just going to, and our kids are just supposed to continue suffering until then. And, and we're talking about, I know you're about to say something, Pamela, these children, these children were doing the right thing. They may, you know, they're kids. They may have been making noise, but they had called AAA waiting. And everyone knows how long AAA uh, on a good day takes to come and help. So I, you know, I just, I find it, yeah, I find it abhorrent. I, I just really enraged as a parent. And, and just lucky, I feel for this community that it didn't uh, further get out of hand. So if I may, I think the link that was sent to me is for audience because I can't even click anything to show, to raise my hand. I looked, I searched in my email. 
So I can't even raise my hand to speak. And it's frustrating to me. It has nothing to do with my laptop. But anyway, can I speak, the coaches? I did. I Is that okay, Pamela? And then we'll get to you. Yes, Ms. Pat. No, go ahead, Dr. Pamela. Go ahead. You want me to go ahead? Yes, Ms. Pat, please. Oh, okay. Proceed. Okay. Yes. So actually, I'm not shocked about the video. This is common occurrence in our community. The only difference once in a while, it will get videotaped. In fact, on June 29th, four MS police cruisers, let me repeat, four MS cru uh, police cruisers surrounded a BIPOC kid, teenager, in an apartment complex close to downtown. So this is regular terrorizing our BIPOC marginalized and marginalized community. So I'm not shocked. It is triggering for me when I first saw the video. So I had to organize CSWG that we need to make a public statement. We put that out to the media, to the town council, to the town management. And last night, the town council met. There was radio silence. Only two brave councillors were able to make some comment in that effect. I will acknowledge that there are some councillors who reach out to some BIPOC folks privately. And I want to thank them for doing that. So if the, the way I read the whole thing is that BIPOC lives don't matter in this town. This will never happen to white teenage kids. It will, it will, if police will not do that. I don't care if it's noise to complain. You don't tell anybody in this country that they don't have any rights. I don't care how old they are. And the most frustrating thing is, it's taken more than two weeks. There has not been any accountability. And this is why this continued to go on in this town because the police, MS police knows that they can do anything that they are above the law and nothing will, you know, nothing will happen to them. They will still keep their job. They have the union, the police union to defend them at a, probably at taxpayers' uh, expense. And meanwhile, we have victims and victims and nothing happens. I think one of the things I would like our group to to think about, to recommend, is to have victim compensation fund. These kids need to be compensated for the trauma they went to. As an adult, myself, a black woman, if I ever interact with police or see police, I'm shaking and I'm not a, a, a young kid. And I can imagine what our children went through that night. It's very triggering, okay? So we need to think about that because it's not okay for what MS police is doing to our community. They're terrorizing our community. They're harassing us. They're over-policing us. So let me go to Crest program. The excuse that the, the training they're on training. I get all that. But we recommended CREST program last year. I believe that was funding for last fiscal year, but we didn't get it up and running until this month. Why is that? Why are we saving the money for what? But it was okay for us to agree to pay for a huge Jones Library project, to pay for, um, uh, I'm a town common project. So the excuse that they're training, I thought when you swear people in, it's after they're ready 
to take on the job. I'm excited about the swearing in, but it's confusing. When you swear people in, they then they start the job. They or do we just want photo up? Is that what we want it for? And I can go on and on, but I will shut my mouth, my mouth up. Um, Ms. Moistin, if you can resend me the link, because this is more of uh, audience that I that I was sent to me. Thank you. I see Pamela has her hand up and then Earl. So um, I'm sure Earl will probably repeat some of the things or expand on some of the things that uh, that I'm going to say. But as you guys know, we were sworn in on July 5th. And um, I can't really speak to the town decisions before July 5th as far as um, starting these programs and um, what funding decisions were made. But I can say that when we became aware, we meaning the DEI department, so Jen and I, um, Earl um, and the town manager became aware about this incident, then we did make some inquiry. Um, there was no formal complaint filed, but in my capacity as the DEI director, I have asked um, for an inquiry about the incident and we are having to utilize the collective bargaining agreement or the procedures that are currently in place because while uh, in the future there might be the residents uh, oversight committee that's not in existence now. So I'm having to utilize uh, the avenues that are currently available to me. So I um, have asked that the police department make an inquiry about the incident. There will be a uh, um, looking into it and reviewing what have occurred. And then I will be um, notified about those results. And then I, you know, I don't know what next steps will be, but um, there has been some action um, taken. Uh, and I just want to speak to the, the swearing in. Um, part of the, the mandate we have is to be different than public safety that's existed before. Uh, and part of what felt important for us was to have uh, the responders kind of have this symbolic, mo it is a symbolic moment, right? There is no like magic moment, but to have this symbolic moment of committing to the town, committing to furthering the principles of folks before they ever started the work. Um, the idea being that was central to us, that commitment. Um, the other piece I just want to say is that you know, we're only doing two months of training that is significantly expedited. Uh, if you look at other communities that are along this journey, a lot of them are looking at year long training processes. Uh, we've used this incident to talk about how do we speak to youth in town. Um, kind of we've done scenarios on how we would respond, who we would bring in. Um, and, you know, I think I They've only done two weeks of training, so it is an unfinished product, obviously, but really our mantra in this has been, you know, thinking about dignity and respect kind of at the forefront, making sure that folks, uh, no matter what their age is, uh, feel respected by us and feel like uh, the things that kind of bind us together as, as citizens are respected. Um, and we're going to continue to work on those things. I'll tell you, you know, we showed the video and folks were eager to provide an alternative response in scenarios like that. And that's, you know, that's kind of the pieces I can speak to. I know that you all have waited a long time. I started at the end of March. We moved as fast as we could. And I wish every day we had been able to start earlier. Um, Deb and then Dee. So, um, you know, Earl and, and, and Pamela, obviously I know you all just came on board and, and, you know, but I know that this job is also kind of like hit the ground running because obviously, you know, we wanted these things in place like yesterday as Ms. Pat was talking about. And in terms of Crest, obviously we understand that, you know, there's a swearing in, there's gonna be, you know, training because we were part of the ones that also recommended the training, right? That we knew that you all had to be trained really well because we want, Crest to be successful and we know that there's going to be there's a lot of eyes and a lot of people that are resistant to Crest and a lot of people that want to see Crest fail so obviously you all do need to be trained very well so I don't think this has anything to do with that I think what Miss Pat was was talking about which I also had the same questions was why did it still take as long as it did right even to hire you or even to you know what I'm saying not not like once you hit the once you got here and, and the and, and you hit the ground running as we know you did you know we just have questions for the town 
right? We have questions for Paul, we have questions for the town in terms of why is it that this, these, these um, departments that are so critical to um, a, a BIPOC community and to you know the community at large, because again, if you're helping BIPOC, you're helping everybody else, right? Why is it that, that these departments are not being taken as seriously and is not being expedited in a way that makes sense? Now, my second question, which I had already pointed out was, okay, we knew that Crest was going to take some time to be up and running because it needed a training. Why was it that, and I, and I wanna see Paul Bachman at the next meeting. You see what I'm saying? I want him at the next meeting to answer these questions in terms of what has been done between when we recommended the part B of, of uh, for the police, right? Until now, what has been done? What has the police done? You know, have they done any training? Have they done anything? Because obviously they haven't. Because by that 54 seconds, which I can only imagine, like I said, what else they said to them, those were the only 54 seconds that, that, that were, were captured. Why hasn't anything else been done to make sure that the police know what to do when they encounter our youth? Because as Ms. Pass said, if it had been other constituents, if it had been white students or what have you, they would have been they would have been given probably a second chance. It would have been talked to differently, and it, and and probably it wouldn't have gotten uh, out of out of control. Because this was, and we know that there was some white youth, but it was pre uh, predominantly BIPOC youth, and in in areas that is over policed and over sur surveilled. So well, I want to know what has been going on at that point. And again, why hasn't there been a reprimand by Paul Bachman, by the town council, by somebody? Somebody needs to address this. You know, I mean, there was 54 seconds of, of this is what we saw. You know, why wasn't there a reprimand based on that? That is my question. I don't care that they, I know that there is, you know, obviously, you know, I work in Equal Opportunity University for many years where we did investigations. I understand there needs to be a thorough investigation. However, there was 54 seconds of a video that showed what transpired. Why wasn't action taken off of that? That is what I want to know. And so Paul and whomever else needs to come in next time for us to have a nice conversation, or probably not so nice, about, about that. Because uh, you know we need some answers. So I have no way of raising my hand. Um, Ms. Pat, can I have a moment and then um, we'll, we'll take you. I have my hand up, I'm sorry. Um, so I have to go back to what uh, Deborah is saying. The, you know, the buck stops at Paul Bockelman and the accountability stops at Paul Bockelman. I sent a letter prior to the CSWG letter to the town council, the Crest director and Paul Bockelman with a very um, short two uh, sentence answer from Lynn Greismer um, saying that they'll look into it. That's not accountability. If it had been their grandchild, their yeah. child, I can imagine the uproar. These are our children. Yeah. And because something wasn't filed as a complaint does not make it less valid. We filed a complaint. These are our children. There are parents of color that I know personally that have their children have been accosted by the police. And because of various circumstances, they will not file a complaint with the police because they are afraid of repercussions for their families and for the children. That is why CSWG took up these issues. That is why my company, Seven Generation, we research what are other towns doing because we are filing the complaint as the citizens, the residents of this town. And for years it has been ignored. And this is our fear that it will continue to be ignored and training be damned. Hey, Crest Director, I understand you're just now in place. No one expects Pamela to start July 5th, but there was an implementation team 
that was already in place trying to supposedly make things happen. What happened with that training? So I know that that is action and discussion item 4E, but I'm proposing, because I'm afraid we won't get to it and find out some of these answers, that we move it up, co-chair, and we can put that to a vote. And I know Ms. Uh, Pat wants to speak, but that is my proposal. We can come back to it, uh, perhaps after Ms. Pat speaks. Thank you. So a couple of things, in addition to accountability, I'm also would like to see the police officers publicly apologize to these kids and their families and to the BIPOC community. Because I feel it's the right thing to do. And I want to specifically um, comment on the uh, town council chair yesterday. She had the opportunity to show leadership yesterday and to heal our community. But she did not mention anything, nothing. Like Dr. Shabazz stated, this will not happen to a white middle-class teenager in this town. It will be the first opening statement in this town. I, and the only thing I can think about is our lives don't mean anything. And people run for office for the next election. They want to get reelected. Re they want to, they want the powerful people to vote for them. That's only that's only thing I can see. That the town council as a body did not make statement. They missed the opportunity yesterday. The only African American town councilor that spoke yesterday, Alicia, and then one white female. The rest, except for one from Middle Eastern. They were all white people. It doesn't bother them because MS police protect them. MS police does not protect me and my family. I'm sorry to say this. I don't, I don't feel that way. And I don't want them in my neighborhood. And God forbid that I would ever need their assistance. Thank you. Dee, before we vote on your motion to move E up, um, I just wanted to check in with Freke or Philip to see if they had anything that they wanted to say regarding the video. Um, and then I did have a few thoughts. I just will echo that. I think it speaks volumes of the lack of comments from our town leadership and other stakeholders involved. And I was also on the call Miss Pat uh, for the meeting that was happening yesterday. And I thought it was very interesting that it was not mentioned at all during the town council meeting. Thank you, Philip. Um, I won't have much to say at the moment until I study this um, a bit more. I think there's room to reflect on what I've seen and so I'll wait till I've studied more. Ah, thank you. Uh, so I guess for me, I think my, my like social work hat came on after seeing this video and, and what, are, what are the appropriate responses? How can we help these youth who have been through this event what can we do to, to make sure this doesn't happen again? And then kind of drawing on some of the wisdom from CSWG, like what, what needs to change in the community? And so I just, you know, I was re-reviewing the CSWG's reports and some of the other materials that were in the packet this morning. And so I watched the video and then the next thing that popped up on my social media feed was a posting from the town, a vacancy, in the police department. And so on page three of part B of the community safety working group, it says, we recommended reducing the size of APD 
a reduction of two positions was made. We believe more substantial reductions are necessary and will become easier as Cress and other of our recommendations are implemented. And so my question slash perhaps action item would be, how do we, how do we get there to be a hiring freeze so that we can have at least six months of data from Cress to see what they have been able to do and what responsibilities they have taken away from the police and, and how they are doing with a team of eight to handle all of the responsibilities that have been given to them and, and the ones that they have created based on, on being out in the community and seeing what needs to happen. So that was, that was one thing. Why are there vacancies in the police department when we're seeing this video of police accosting youth? Um, second was, you know, is with the resident oversight board, which I hope it, you know, I've, I've heard is the next top priority for the DEI department. Um, I was rereading the information here about the resident oversight board. And I did see that one of the recommendations was that they could arrange things related to um, on page 13, engage in outreach to the community for the purpose of assisting community members to know their rights. And I think the kids in this video did an excellent job of questioning why they were being detained in a respectful manner. And I can only imagine how terrified that, that must, terrifying that situation must have been. And I do think that having education for our community members around their legal rights is really an important thing to do. And if it's, if it's an outside agency that comes in to do that, if it's supported by DEI or CREST or the Resident Oversight Board or us as this body, I think, I think that would be something that would be great to see. Um, third, my question is how do we how do we reach out to whoever it was that called the police? Maybe not in this particular instance, but how are we calling people in to say, hey, if you hear loud noises coming from kids out in the parking lot, you want to check what's up with them? They're having car troubles. Did you say, hey, want to call your parents and get picked up? Like, are there different ways that we can engage the community in taking care of each other? And I think you know, that's kind of envisioning, again, a reduction in the you know, size and scope of the police department if, if we can take care of each other by helping each other in, in situations like this rather than calling the police, then again, that reduces our need for police because we're building community with each other. Um, and I guess my last kind of question was if, you know, if there are ongoing incidents with the police and our BIPOC youth, is it foreseen as a possible role of Crest to do some check-ins with the people who have been impacted by these interactions afterwards? Like, would it be appropriate or within their scope of work to reach out and say, hey, I heard that there was an incident last night. Can, what can we do to support you? That must have been a really tough time for you. Um, so those are the thoughts that I had with the video. And I think, I think there was one more, sorry, I promise. This is the last thing I'm gonna say. Um, I think that it goes back to, again, the, the community visioning that Dr. Love had talked about that was included in part B, like there needs to be some healing, not just for the kids who were involved in this instance, but all of the kids who have been impacted by their police contacts and the community as a whole. Um, so I think to kind of echo what Ms. Deborah and Ms. D and Ms. Pat have said, like why <laughs> it's July, this, this report is dated October, 2021. It's almost August, 2022. What has gone on? Has, have any of these plans been implemented? Um, and I see D and Earl have their hands up and Deborah. Yeah, I think Earl had his hand up before mine and then I'll, I'll wait. Yes, sorry, I, I'm still getting the hang of these, these meetings. Uh, I just wanted to say to both of the questions there, 
that absolutely I see it as our role to help folks be aware of their rights. Um, it's something that I had some experience in Springfield with, and uh, I think it's just an incredibly important piece. Um, and the second piece around checking in with folks after uh, challenging interactions with, with any kind of first responder group, um, that's something that we have uh, already done once or twice and that we're really building a capacity to. Um, for me, the most important part is the person experiencing the trauma and so making sure that that folks are okay and and that they're able to process it and use any processes they feel uh that 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 they feel that are available to them um is something that i i believe in deeply so absolutely so thank you earl so first off thank you allegra and that's why this this group this committee is so integral to this this community because we come with so many different backgrounds and experiences and so thank you for for lending your social work hat and experience to this and think about thinking about the the children and the community first and what should happen and going back to the cswg report um because this is being recorded i guess we don't have to note that I too would like to see what you suggested going back to that CSWG report. Um, you know, we need to look at once again that request, that demand coming out of research that do we really need to fill more um, policing positions? To what good is that? To what end? You know, particularly if it only gets us police um, harassment and accosting and traumatizing of our youth. To what end? Um, you know, I would like to see uh, the CRESS, the, the, the group that was appointed July 5th, how are they worked into checking on uh, the youth and their the families? Because first they need to check in with the families to see if that's even okay because there is an issue of trust. And not without healing will that trust happen. So where is Crest and DEI in terms of that? Or is that something that we as a group, uh, CSSJC, maybe we need to put together separate and apart from Crest and DEI? Um, because again, it's an issue of healing and trust. And how would we be compensated or, you know, someone like Dr. Barbara Love, who has a lot of trust in the community, um, how would she be compensated to do that? So these are things I'd like for us to discuss. Again, you know, the CSWG report, I would like to um, at some point make a motion to get to the implementation team report because I don't necessarily think we're gonna get to everything tonight, um, but we do need to prioritize, but I don't wanna dictate that. I would like for it to come up as a vote and to see where everyone else, you know, um, where they are. Uh, within this agenda and what should be prioritized um, in, in terms of discussion tonight, because the APD Facebook video, that is of the utmost importance that we figure out what are the next steps so that this does not happen again. Summer's not over. What are the next steps? What is Crest and DEI and the town manager and our town council and policing, what are they gonna do to make sure this does not happen again? How can we help and support in making sure this does not happen again? Um, thank you, DIC Deb. And then it did look like Miss Pat raised her hand and then perhaps took it down. Um, so it, it's back up. So yeah. Deborah and then Pat. <laughs> so um, just quickly, uh, and and then we can go to your to think about your motion, um, D. 
because obviously it's important for us to kind of take a vote because I also think we're not we're going to run out of time so we need to kind of prioritize but really just you know two quick thoughts and I, and I hope we can just add this to the agenda for next time because like I said I think we need to talk to Paul Bachman about about his response or like thereof and in terms of the town but also I want to know along with what we're saying how pressing this is around part A and part B, because part A, the youth empowerment um, center and the multicultural uh, BIPOC uh, center, as well as everything in part B, where, where are things at with that? Because we know that there's this whole budget process and so on and so forth. And then before we know it, he'll say, oh, it, you know, that, that'll have to wait until the next fiscal year because we know how the game is played. We, we learned it last year. So I really need us to have Paul Bachman next time because I have some pressing questions for him in regards to the response and also the budget in terms of part A and part B, making sure that we know what needs to be done so that those things in part A and part B can, can come to fruition. So th those are the two things. And then really quickly, Allegra, thank you so much for bringing up all those points. And then Earl, you, you kind of confirmed around the training, but the only thing that I wanna be just kind of, we always wanna be very, um, intentional about the training we provide to our youth, especially our BIPOC youth, because I'm an attorney and I've, I've provided legal rights um, training to, to young people um, around what their rights are and everything. But I also have two black uh, males as kids. And, I, I, and I'll be truthful for you as a black mother, even though I'm an attorney, I tell them not to say anything. I tell them for them to know their rights, but for them not to go in and, and, and say a lot to the, towards the police because I'm afraid for their lives right? Because they might get beat down or they might, you know, or whatever. I tell them to say as much as they can and, and, and sense what's going on. So that needs to be done very, very cautiously and very, very well. Because really I say, just call me, you know what I'm saying? So that I can go in and I could be the one, because what I want is for you to be alive, for me to be able to go in and do what I need to do, you know, as an attorney. So that's the only thing that I want to say. We, we need to make sure that whoever is presenting that information to our BIPOC kids know how they're pre presenting that information so that we can make sure that they're safe. Ms. Pat. So um, I do agree that we should prioritize our agenda tonight um, in support of what Dr. B has suggested. Just very quickly, I don't want this to get lost, but there was a reference made in the media that DEI department was fully, is fully funded. I just want to remind everyone that CSWG recommended three, the DEI director, the assistant director, and an administrative assistant for that department. In addition to that, we also recommended the youth center, the youth empowerment center to be part of the DEI department, as well as BIPOC uh, cultural center, translation services. And I can go on and on and on. And with the upcoming budget season, my understanding is in October is when different departments will start talking about capital projects. So I'm just announcing tonight that um, we should really um, think about or let the town council and town, uh, town manager know that we need the youth center this time. There is money in this town. We are well resourced. We are, we, you know, our tax base is very high. So we have the money. It's just what is our priority? So we need um, youth center by cultural center that we call our own space. Okay, so I just want to touch on those and I will just shut up. So with the CREST program, it's not fully funded. We all know that. We recommended 15 um, CREST responder, including their supervisors plus the director. And what, we, what did we get? 50% of the staffing. So we're, you know, we're hoping this will work out, but let's see. I have my doubts that eight responders is nothing but setting up for failure. All of a sudden, the predominantly, you know, white town council don't have money to fund 
um, Crest program, but there's money. Again, I keep going back to Jones, oversized Jones Library. We have money to, to fund dog, dog park. That's where our priorities in this town. We have money to fund, to uh, do town uh, common. I'll keep repeating that. We have money to have an economic director, development director. Why do we need that when we have bid the home, the commercial um, um, building owners and land owners in this town, they need to hire their own development uh, director to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, so, D. So, I would like to, yeah, make a motion, but I, I do want to hear discussion about prioritizing these. It is now 7.15. We have under action and discussion items, CSWG 7 Gen LEAP report. We also have CSSJC webpage, which I'm just guessing we're going to get an update on that. And then the implementation team report, which was a one page report in the packet and then the organizational chart. Um, then we have updates, Crest Department, DEI Department, Resident Oversight Board, Translation Services, Youth Empowerment Center, and BIPOC Multicult Multicultural Center. I think just, and I'd like to make this motion to, to get into my thinking here, that we should move up the implementation team report, which is 4E, and um, under updates, the Resident Oversight Translation Services and Youth Empowerment Center. And what I'm thinking is that that will segue, since those are part of CRESS and DEI departments anyway, and that might uh, uh, make up your update. So that's a lot, I could rephrase that to make it smoother, I suppose. So my motion, is to reprioritize the agenda by moving the item 4E implementation team report to next point of business and include under updates C, D, and E, Resident Oversight Board, Translation Services, and Youth Empowerment Center and BIPOC Multicultural Center. That's my motion. Second. Well, no, it has to go to discussion. Discussion. Does anybody have anything to say? Well, um, for me, the only other thing that, that would, would be important though, is in terms of the, you know, like the CSWG 7 Gen LEAP report, not that we need to kind of like go into specifics about that, but just that those need to be part of, you know, our our next month discussion with Paul Bachman. You see what I'm saying? Because those don't include all of the other ones. I mean, obviously the resident oversight board translation services, huge empowerment, but it doesn't include all the part B. You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, right. Which is obviously critical in what it, what just happened in terms of, of the young people because the police department is still out there doing whatever they want to do. And as Ms. Pat said, thinking they're above the law. So, Absolutely. And what I remember from, well, from, from the, the minutes from last time was that we wanted to go over the CSWG 7 Gen Leap report for the participants who were not part of that process. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, if, and if I'm mistaken on that, please someone correct me. So I do think it's important to go over it once we have Paul Bockelman in the room. Okay. Okay. But if I recall, and in reading the, the minutes, it had to do with updating uh, Dr. Eke uh, and then um, Philip about those reports because they weren't part of the process. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that as long as we, okay. we, can, we can put that on for, okay, we're really going to kind of focus Agreed. on that for the next meeting with Paul Bachman, because we need to make sure that those other recommendations along with, of course, the resident oversight and everything else is on the scope. 
Agreed. And so what you're saying, Deborah, and I'm just going to just try to rephrase so it gets down in the minutes correctly, is that we are going to go over those reports to make sure everything is on track to being fulfilled. Exactly. Exactly. And Got if it's you. not, why it's not? And we need to ask questions. Where is it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Can I just ask, I guess, for a point of clarification around the CSSJC webpage um, item? I, is that just an update that we have a web page, or is, is there discussion that somebody thought was needed around what goes on it? Or Yep, so I put the charge and the standard information that is typically on a web page, but also you guys can kind of, it's your page, so there's if you want a resources section, what information do you want on the page and um, stuff like that. So that can be tabled easily. Okay. And Thank I you. would just help that everybody takes a look at the page so they can kind of have an idea for the next meeting of what they might want to see on the page. And, and we send those suggestions to you? Yes. Okay. Without I, replying all. Do not reply all, right. please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for putting that up. Any other discussion? Okay, so I'm going to restate my motion. I move that action and discussion items for E implementation team report uh, be prioritized for discussion now and items 5, C, D, and E under updates. I'll second it. So, well, I made the I made the motion. So someone needs to move first. Oh, did you you moved Allegra? I'm sorry. Did I move? I moved earlier. Yes. Okay. So okay. now, yeah, okay. Philip uh, seconded. it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We just Aye. we have to hear a thumbs up. Uh, Dr. Eke. Um, a question. So. Mm -hmm. Five D C C D and E C D and E. Yes. Does that immediately go after implementation? Yes, I'm guessing. Uh, yes, that's in order. Yes. Would you like to change it? Um. No, I think I'm fine. I just wanted to know what the okay. um, process was. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. So yes. Okay. So all in favor? The motion moves. Thank you. So you want to go ahead, Allegra, or I can, or All what right. do you want to do? So we are now moving along to the implementation team report. Yes, which is the last item in your packet. It's a one page item. And so Earl, I guess if you can discuss it, um, I have a few questions after you present. Sure. Um, so just for context sake, I put this in there. I just want to say it again. My experience with this group wasn't comprehensive. They existed before I started. Um, so I don't know if my arriving shifted their makeup. Uh, I don't have notes for those meetings. I can only kind of speak to what I experienced. Um, the implementation group was largely advisory. Um, the way it would work is we would, I would kind of list the things that had come up during that week. Um, they often would help reorient me to what the CSWG recommendations were or the LEAP report recommendations. Um, this included things like vehicles, um, the vehicles were ordering, uh, hiring, they helped us to think through uh, questions, what candidates we would look for, our engagement strategy, uh, what apartment complexes would we prioritize, um, what community events would we prioritize being at, um, the Chief Livingstone, Chief Nelson, uh, Mike Curtin, Gabe Ting. Yeah, you can see there the the residents, the uh, the members of the group. Um, it was really uh, by the time I got here, we met regularly through the month of April. Um, in May, we started to meet uh, biweekly uh, because we started to hire for the implement for the assistant, the program assistant, which took a lot of uh, time. And then by June, we met once really just to kind of finalize where we were to establish that this group was starting to meet that kind of their time had, had sunset. Um, there was no, in my time here, any funding used for the group. The group didn't um, organize any events. Um, 
part of the reason why I say directly is there were some things like the apartment complexes we were going to go to that did use some some funding um, and they recommended where we should go. So I wouldn't say that there was no conversation about budget, but but that's really where it was. Um, and uh, we met with folks as they could come, uh, recognizing that some of the group members are parents and have other responsibilities. Uh, I did as, my best to keep everyone as involved as possible, but uh, it was tricky. Uh, there was a lot of work happening. So I appreciated their flexibility and their willingness to work with me. And, and uh, in large part, it was an, an educational experience for me, catching me up on the town. Uh, Russ, who's in the audience today, uh, his contributions to this group were huge. He gave me a list of people to go see, and uh, a lot of those relationships really bore fruit. So uh, that that was my experience with it. I recognize that it met before I started on March 21st. I, I just can't speak to that because I wasn't here. Okay, thank you. Um, can you give us some sense of the role of Wilson Damar or Daman? and Abdullah uh, Galayimi uh, on I the implementation team? I never met Wilson. Uh, I don't know anything about him, so I can't speak to that. Uh, um, Abdullah was the implementation manager before I came in, for about a week before I came in and for about a month after I started. Um, and during this, uh, my experience was he was using this often to kind of discuss the same things I mentioned, what we were, what trainings we were going to bring into. Uh, although I do believe he only had uh, the one meeting without me. Uh, Jennifer can maybe speak to that historical piece longer than I can. Yes, one moment. And then can you talk to us about the role of YSET and Dr. Paula and ADMA, who uh, were also part of the implementation team? Who are they and uh, what was their role? They did not attend implementation meetings while I was here, so they had no role. I, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to speak to their role uh, in the larger sense of Crest uh, publicly, given uh, where our conversations are with folks. Okay, well, folks aren't understanding that. So uh, YSET is, can you identify who YSET is and who ADMA is, please? Uh, YSET is uh, an agency based out of Springfield that Dr. Starnes leads that does youth work. Um, ADMA is a clinical agency out of Springfield as well, uh, led by Gary Porter and David Lewis that uh, does a lot of therapeutic work. Um, and so that's, that's really my, my understanding of them. And what was their role in the implementation uh, services and team? None while I was here. Okay, so the, this isn't a complete report then? They, they, this is a complete report. They never attended any of these meetings while I was here. They were not a part of them. But this is the, there's one part of this that's a committee and then the implementation team is a team that was working on uh, things prior to Chris. Is that correct? I, I don't know. Okay, so again, then this isn't a complete report. Okay, so Jennifer, you want to fill us in as best you can? Yeah, so the implementation team was the people who were listed on here from public safety and then including myself and prior to Earl coming. And so we worked on um, job descriptions during that time for the Crest director, job descriptions for the responders, job descriptions for the DEI department, the negotiations of them. Um, we also worked on, and uh, we didn't want it to work on the policy and procedure part of Crest until the director got there, but we tried to have an outline set up of the different places we wanted them to do community outreach to, uh, the vehicles. We tried to work on the shifts to kind of design what the shifts could look like. We tried to work with or work on everything that involved Crest except for policy and procedure. Okay. And so during that implementation team, YSET and ADMA were not part of that team. We met separately. It was myself, Sean Mangano, ADMA and YSET were meeting on Thursdays in a separate manner. Okay, and what was their role, I'm asking? Yeah, so ADMA's role was to come in and to provide um, mental health services to whom? And to residents of Amherst. 
Okay. And they and were doing that in that uh, function or was it just? They weren't, do we, they weren't to start that until Crest was more formulated and there was a director. So we were just getting them set up and ready to move forward. Okay. And then um, YSET was supposed to do case management. Okay. And did they do case management? Uh, no, because we didn't get that far for them to do the case management. We didn't have people to send to them to, for referrals. Okay. And so um, are they still involved with Cress? That would be Earl. Uh, yeah, I, 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 right now, no. Okay, so Adma and Wyset are not involved. No. Okay. Um, so can we inquire why they are not involved? What occurred? From my understanding, these are BIPOC uh, run uh, and owned uh, businesses that provide uh, psychological and social services. I, I can't speak about that publicly without uh, having a better sense from fiscal and folks where we are along in processes. Uh, I don't. I don't want to make any declaratory statements while there's still conversations happening. Oh, okay. Uh, what I, what so, I can what I can say with Adma is the door isn't closed on Adma. Uh -huh. um, we're looking at our DPH funding. We we kind of ended the fiscal year on good terms. Um, we're RFPing for mental health services. We encourage Adma to, to work with us. We are still uh, we still have a a good relationship with them and, and we did not leave on any bad terms. Okay, so are you signaling that you left on bad terms with YSET? Nope, no, I, I, I don't have any bad terms. I, what I know is that uh, Dr. Starnes asked me not to speak publicly about this situation and so I'm gonna honor that. Okay, so again, that wasn't in the report so it's, it's leaving a lot out. The other thing that I'd like to know um, and you're saying that you weren't there during that time, but from my understanding, there was a grant used uh, to um, uh, pay for the implementation. And so, you know, I'd like to know funding wise, uh, was all that spent on YSET and ADMA and also on the two managers, Wilson, uh, Derman and Abdallah, uh, and what happened with that? Yep, so that's something I can speak to. DPH recognized that we, they started the funding very late in the year. Um, there was net, it was always gonna be a struggle. It was a struggle for every municipality that participated in that. Um, so that money has been capped and rolled over into this fiscal year. Um, it is a rare situation in which the state made a decision to allow fiscal money to be spent into the next fiscal year. So the money is still there um, and still being uh, you know, budgeted for implementation. Uh, I, I, I wanna add though, that I disagree with the statement that uh, I left something out of this report. Adma and YSET were not a part of the implementation as far as I was involved in it. They were not. Okay, well, so what, what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the report was the report. So whether you had to, to go to other folks, you know, in my opinion, to get a fuller report to bring to us, I would have appreciated that. So I understand you're saying, as far as you know, and within your knowledge base, this is the report, but it's not a full report of the implementation uh, team and actions. They, That's they, my statement. I, yeah, I, I just, again, I disagree. They weren't a part of the implementation. They were an addendum service. Um, and there were challenges on every side in delivering those services. I can speak to ADMA's side of things. Uh, we were able to generate three referrals for them. Um, there was always going to be a struggle to generate referrals when I was the only employee of the team, even when we had an implementation manager. Um, the amount of volume that we were able to create for a service provider didn't necessarily reflect a large agency setting aside two clinicians uh, full time for the work. So uh, we worked through that with ADMA. Um, but again, I, I just disagree with the assertion that they were a part of the implementation of this, even in my understanding from before I was here. Okay, well, uh, not knowing their, fully what their role is and, and the context, then I don't know either. From my understanding, it was part of the implementation, but that's okay. No, um, can so I just, uh-huh, yeah. yes. So why set, there were 
YSET and ADMA were not part of the implementation team at all. The implementation team was a team that the town manager created that was internal and included the folks from the CSWG, two, three members from CSWG. So they weren't part of that implementation team. Wilson Darbin, as you asked before, was a implementation project manager who left the town. And then Abdallah was an implementation manager too. But YSET and ADMA were never part of the implementation team itself. I think they may have, and I can't remember 100% come and introduce themselves, but they were never part of building CRESS in that way of, of being part of the implementation team. Um, one of the other things the implementation team did do was we did have community outreach events. We had, I believe, three of them where we were, we kind of first collected information that the community wanted. The second one was kind of like, this is where we are. And then the third one was, this is where we are even farther, similar to that. And okay. so we looked for folks' input from there. Okay, I appreciate that, but if I may, I'm still uncertain as to what their role was or is, and that seems to be problematic. If I may, yes, and then Deborah also had her hand up. If I may, so yes. I am very um, familiar with Wise and Atma. And the former director to senior center services, I must, was the one actually who worked on the grant. And the press implementation team, which I was not part of, that I was asked to attend one of the meetings. And there was a mention of in order for DPH to award the grant there has to be a social services agency or mental health, whatever. And there was a talk about a white led agency to partner with the town. I want everybody to hear this, okay? I happened to be at that meeting, I pushed back. I said, have we even explore BIPOC led mental health or social agencies? That's how it, it happened. So I did my research and I introduced the former director for senior services with Dr. Paula. The reason why grant was being explored is because the town council refused to fully fund CRES program. So those two organizations in Springfield were supposed to supplement, help enhance, okay, enhance CRES program. They were not part of the implementation team. That's correct. However, the, the grant was supposed to help with the CREST program. So we're, we're, we're missing that. And that is very critical that BIPOC-led organizations were treated so badly in this town. I am embarrassed about it. And we don't have too many BIPOC uh, contractors or um, consultants that work for our town. In fact, in our next meeting, I would like to request that the finance department produce a list of contractors and consultants that we do business with to see how much of our taxpayers' money is flowing into our community. This is what this uh, CSSJC is all about. We, you know, when we're talking about DEI, it means more than just, um, but anyway, it, it should also include financial resources, how much of it is flowing into our community. So it breaks my heart that a highly reputable organization in Springfield led by a black woman was treated this, this way. I just Gen, wanna, sorry. Seven Gen also had to like, at some point to release their funds. Why are we doing this for people of color? I am exhausted. Thank you. I, Thank you, Miss Pat, for, uh, for the clarification. Is it okay if I respond to pieces of that? I'm, I'm still getting sure. the hang of this. Sure. So I, I would disagree with the assertion that people were treated poorly. Folks can feel differently about that. Um, I'll tell you one of the challenges we face is Cress is a startup. 
and being responsible to and for other startups who were, you know, they their agency in Springfield is a, it's just a different community than Amherst. It, it just is. Um, and the DPH uh, grant continues. It was always a town grant and they have continued. They're happy with us. When we RFP these, there will be a priority for BIPOC led agencies and for agencies that are not BIPOC led, that the pieces of contracting they do with us be led by BIPOC folks and that they show a commitment to um, actually empowering folks in their own agency. So uh, that commitment stands, DPH holds to it, we hold to it. Um, and we, we had a conversation as early as last week about how we could hold to that. If people actually read CSWG recommendations, we were very, very clear that with the CREST program in particular, to make sure that BIPOC-led groups be involved. This is part of reparation, okay? And it's not what we're getting. I think it's important that MS residents exactly know what was going on because the complaint was brought to CSWG we tried, but it didn't work out. Meanwhile, they haven't been paid yet. That is, that is our understanding, and that is something that I'm hoping uh, Dr. Pamela will look into. You know, when we talk about D DEI is top to bottom, from the janitors to, um, you know, top administrators at town hall level. Um, we need equity. This, this town is changing in terms of its demographic. Our children reflect that in the school district. And so this town needs to become 21st century town where people, the diversity is reflected in uh, the roles and responsibilities in this community. So uh, I know you'll, you'll have something to say, uh, Dr. Pamela, but Deborah, please. Yeah. Yeah, so um, for me, you know, I've been hearing obviously, you know, different like pieces here and there, um, you know, so from what I'm gathering from this conversation is that one, we did ask for an implementation team report. So um, Earl, even though, yeah, you gave us a slice from when you were there, I would want to get a complete uh, report from, you know, from the group that was there, you know, before, as well as as your report, so something more comprehensive that really kind of you know reflects what the implementation team did, and so that we can have like you know where to kind of compare and to include you know obviously uh, Adma and Yset, you know even if there were an addendum, you know what was their role, right? Uh, it, even if there was something that was discussed as they were going to be providing services afterwards we would need that this description, especially because we have new members, right? We have new members, people who have never been part of it. I have a lot of the history, but even with me, I only have pieces of what has, is being discussing here. So being discussed here. So it seems like a, a certain, you know, like folks have, have part and parcel of the knowledge and, and we don't have all of it and stuff. And, and for me, for, for me to be able to make decisions and to say things constructive is for me to be able to have that information. So I also would like to find out about what transpired, right? Now it's, it's, it's here. We have the public comment. We, we, we're discussing it here. I want to know what transpired in terms of ADMA and why set for the next meeting. I want to get information uh, prior to that in terms of, you know, where things at. That will be something else to add to Mr. Bachman's list of questions in terms of their contract and where that is at in terms of whether they're working with us or they're not working with us and whether they got paid or they didn't get paid. I don't know. I need to know. So, because again, we want these things to go well. We want things to, to go as smooth as possible. We know it's gonna be bumping the roads, but we need transparency and we need to, to be able to figure this out as a community and as a group, right? So for me, that would be very helpful. And like I said, I have certain information. So I never mind some of these new members. I can only, you know, you know, know what they're thinking because they don't have any information. So we need a comprehensive report, right? With this information and Mr. Bachman to respond to some of these things. Absolutely. Thank you, Deborah. So can we get um, a more fully uh, wrought report um, pertaining to where you begin, Earl? Jennifer, 
what your part is and um can we get uh some some narrative uh prior to that uh that would include uh captain ting uh and uh it would include abdallah and if you can reach wilson i understand abdallah is still here in the community so if that's possible uh we would appreciate it you know i i uh, visited molly years ago and the ancient people of Mali, because Mali is a very modern uh, place, of course, but the ancient people of Mali, they made totem poles. And the totem pole uh, was one part for each family in the village. And so you had to have all the families of the village gather around that totem pole to be able to tell the whole story of the community. We need that. We need that because stories are getting lost, narr narratives are already getting uh, hidden, erased, and I, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just folks trying to really control the narrative. That's not healing. That's not going to bring healing and it's not going to bring trust. So I'm asking all the families, so to speak, to write up implementation and for us to continue in that path so that we can be transparent and have the whole story when it comes to social justice in this community. If I may add one group that we missed, the CSWG members of implementation team, Mr. Ross Venon Jones, um, Alicia Walker, and Bri Brianna Owen, I would like to get their perspective, their experiences with the implementation team as well. If they can get us a report, that would be great. So that's the other request. Thank you, Ms. Pat, for adding that. Any other part of the discussion pertaining to the implementation team report? Thank you so much. We'll, we'll move on. Allegra? Yes, um, if we could get an update regarding the Resident Oversight Board. So I think it might be um, uh, easier for me to give you uh, an update on the DEI department and combine that with the Resident Oversight Board as well as the Youth Empowerment Center because it all sort of ties in together. So. Um, since I was sworn in, I've met with about 50% of the department heads and directors, um, including um, the superintendent of the school department in Amherst. So I'm starting to make the rounds to, to meet the, the rest of the leadership team here. Uh, Jen and I have started working on a strategic plan for the department as a whole and um, are putting together a first draft of that. I've also put together a first draft of a timeline for implementation of the Resident Oversight Board. Um, and I have reviewed uh, both the A and B reports from the working group, as well as the uh, LEAP report and did some additional research. So I'm really starting to immerse myself in understanding exactly um, what the prior working group thought was really important, as well as you know, diving deep in, and really learning this area myself because it is a new area uh, uh, for me. Um, I would suspect that at the next meeting, we would uh, be able to present that draft of the timeline um, uh, to this group to, and to have discussion about when we think that we might be able to get the resident oversight um, uh, board up and running. Uh, I do have a lot of questions about about the operation of the board. I'm I'm reading the, I guess now two years old, uh, new law that put in together the, is it post the police oversight training legislation. So I'm 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 really just trying to get get a handle on all of on all of the legal aspects of that as far as how it might implement the timeline. Um, I. I know that the town manager has um, has planned on putting together a small working group to work on the youth empowerment center that would include myself, uh, the director of the uh, rec, 
from REC, as well as um, Sean Mingo from the um, finance department. So we are sort of aware that there is a timeline for having um, you know, a plan in place that would meet the, the current budgetary timeline for the city. So that's all ongoing. Um, and I think that that probably, I the one thing that I can, that's in, that I have not touched on is um, starting to look at the BIPOC Multicultural Center. So I haven't done uh, any work um, or um, in that area yet, but the other areas we have begun to make some progress on. So thank you, Dr. Young. Um, as And for reading the CSWG, the LEAP report, and I'm sure you've read uh, the Seven Generation uh, Movement Collective Report as well and looked at our research. Um, one of the things I'm always concerned about is when uh, the town has talked about the Youth Empowerment Center, um, the, the narrative, the discourse around it is that it is something that um, uh, the Rec Center or the Jones Library is a part of. And my concern, going back to the CSWG request, is that this is a BIPOC youth led empowerment center. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, young white allies cannot participate. That's not what that means. But it does mean that it is the empowerment is that it's BIPOC youth led. And so I don't want that narrative to get and request to get away from um, DEI and the town in terms of the formation of this center. So um, as I said, we're just in the beginning. Um, I, I had a, I've met with the rec director that was last week. Um, Sean and I have met, but we didn't, we actually had discussions around another issue, not this issue. So um, I, I will certainly make sure that we're aware of that concern and um, I know the importance of, of having uh, a BIPOC led um, organization in my previous role as a volunteer. Um, I actually was on the board of directors for a um, BIPOC organization, which I think would actually have some really good um, information and narratives that would be helpful for this youth department center. It was, uh, unfortunately they're disbanding, but it was a group that was started by two Notre Dame um, uh, students. And um, the purpose of the group was to use stories and narratives to, um, to empower um, youth. And they function mostly in the South Bend region in Chicago. But I think there's some lessons there that I've learned from them that I could, could certainly share with this community. So as we go forward, I will make sure that that stays front and center. I mean, obviously you all read and prepared those reports. So you know, they're very comprehensive. There's a lot of, um, of stuff to go through just to gather all of the information, but um, it is my intention to really adhere to the wishes of the group as closely as possible as we move forward. Absolutely. And Dr. Young, I do appreciate that you're meeting with these folks, but it sounds like, um, you know, the, and I understand this, the circle is small <laughs> right now, but, you know, pulling from um, Miss Pat, uh, a Deborah, you know, uh, Philip, you know, you now have Dr. A.K. I mean, there are other people of color who immediately within this committee, but then there are others from the CSWG, particularly uh, younger folks, uh, I'll speak for myself, than me, uh, young Darius, who was on the CSWG committee. So, you know, there are uh, groups uh, and volunteers that have been a part of this community and trying to shape it uh, for the better, particularly for our youth, that you could certainly uh, have access to if 
contacted. So I just want you to keep in mind that, yes, I understand this, the circle is small now as you begin, but um, to enlarge, uh, as you say, those stories and those narratives in order to shape it to become an institution, because we want it here, not just, you know, in the, the next year, we want it here for the, the, the youth who will come here next generation, you know, uh, we want to make sure that it that it remains and that it's sustainable. So please make sure that circle is broadened as uh, you go through your planning stages and process. I will. Thank you. Um, Ms. Patman Deb. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Dr. Pamela, thank you so much for representation and what you've explained. Um, I don't know if you are aware, and I want to raise this. I heard that there was hundred thousand dollars for disability study for youth center. CSWG already did that, and Seven Gen they did the research for us. My understanding is that the town is exploring in contracting out youth program. So either to a local agency. This is not what CSWG want. This is not what BIPOC youth want. We want the Youth Empowerment Center to be run by DEI department, by you, is what we want, just to be clear. We are not opposed if just library want to have their own youth center. That's different from youth empowerment center. That is the reason why we call it empowerment. There's a reason for that. It does not belong to leisure services department. No, it belongs to DEI. This is a very crucial information you need to bear in mind as you meet with the finance director and the leisure um, department as well. I just want to, you know, uh, put that out. I know that fund is from APA funds, but um, we don't want it contracted out. I'm sorry, the, the town needs to, to run it. Thank you. I, I have not heard um, any conversation about uh, the Youth Empowerment Center being contracted out. So but that comes as news to me. It was mentioned in, the, in one of the finance committee uh, meetings. It was mentioned there. Right, I was in attendance at that finance committee meeting as well. And so I questioned also that 100,000 uh, that was going to be utilized and it came from the mouth of Sean Magano um, for uh, exploratory uh, services for the Youth Empowerment Center. So uh, if you could perhaps bring back word on that and some clarification, we would appreciate it. I can, I can go. Yeah. yeah, and I guess just to kind of, um, since they just brought it up in terms of that $100,000, I mean, when I've talked to other members of the community, that's one of the things, right? The town is always saying that it, they, they, they don't have money, they don't have money, and then all of this. So then it's like $100,000 for feasibility study, and we're kind of like, what? Why are you putting that money into the youth empowerment center and some of these other, you know, the, the multicultural centers, so on and so forth, as opposed to going and using $100,000 feasibility when we, we already had the study done by 7th Gen. We already did all the work in terms of CSWG. What you need to do right now, and, and again, respectfully, right? But you know, is what like Ms. Pat and, 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 and Dr. D is talking to you all about right now, which is ask the people that are on the ground, right? So Darius was part of CSWG, he's, he's a young person. I mean, it's gonna be critical to talk to the young people, right? And the young BIPOC young people. They're really the, the, the first people that you need to talk to is them, right? In terms of what do they want? What do they see as important? And where should it be uh, housed? So they're the ones, right? So there's there's the people of Color United, Poku at, at Amherst High, you know, that is a whole bunch of young people who are leaders in that group, right? So you can just go there and you have a, a ready-made focus group. You know, Mary Custard is the one that oversees them and things like that. Get in touch with Mary Custard and you can have direct access. They are the ones you need to discuss with, 
first and foremost, as opposed to all these other bureaucratic people and adult, adults that seem to think they know it all, and they don't, you know, it's the young people. Um, and then second, you know, as, as what um, Gossidi was saying, it's just like, you know, tap us, right? You know, tap, tap us folks from the CSWG. I know you're reading our reports, but even though our reports are comprehensive, it still doesn't have our, our energy, our passion, our, our thought in terms of why we were thinking certain, certain things. Um, so tap us because we have very specific information uh, because again, a report, we couldn't make it a thousand pages, right? You have to condense it. We, we have a lot of specific information as to why the oversight board, everything we wrote in that report was very specific and it has a story behind it. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, letting you know all this because I know you're going to get pulled in a lot of different directions, but I want you to get the information um, from the folks that really it's going to, you know, have the best interest of everyone in mind, but especially BIPOC and especially in terms of young people, they're the ones that we're going to serve. So they need to be front and center in terms of, of the information. Ms. Pat, do you just still have your hand up or you want oh, to say? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. I just want to, I just want to emphasize with, you know, and, and I know you know that and you're going to get tired of hearing it, but there's an issue of healing and trust that we just don't have in this community. Um, Crest director, DEI director, we are not interested in window dressing. We are absolutely not interested in window dressing. We have been here too long and in this struggle too long to settle for window dressing. And we know how our elected officials often roll. So we're not interested in that. We want accountability, we want input, and we demand to be at the table. So it's smart to include us in the network because we're not going to be silent. We, we know it doesn't work. I've been here 15 years. Deborah's been here 24. Miss Pat, 40. she's from not, she, I'm about to say Miss Pat's from Nigeria, but she's been here forever. So, you know, our, our voices are needed. And if not our voices, people in the community like us, because we are about accountability and making sure things improve in this town. So I just, you know, with all due respect, it's not personal. It is absolutely not personal, but we are not interested in window dressing. And so the, these are the networks and we have access to networks. You know, POKU, as Deborah is, is saying, you know, young Darius Cage, you know, who worked in, in, with MSAN, exactly, MSAN. I mean, we have young people that, if you work with the networks, we can give you access to because that's not that's a that's a privilege, right? You have to. I mean, we know their families, we we know that their teachers. Um, so it's not just oh, you you roll up into a school and say, hey, you know, this is about working together and hearing people's voices, as you say, those stories and those narratives, and working together to shape something important something long lasting and sustainable. Anyone else about the, um, you've given us the DEI, uh, did we hear about translation? Are you working on the translation also, Dr. Young? So I have not worked on translation, but I know Jen has an, an update about, uh, about the translation. Okay, Jennifer. So we have two updates for translation services. So um, through the Disabilities Advisory Commission, they've received a grant to put in hearing assist, assisted hearing devices over at the bank center for the meetings that happen over at the bank center and the activities that happen at the banks. They're already in the town room here at town hall. And also uh, Bree is working on a program on purchasing a program through the funds that were earmarked and it's a minimal amount it's less than i think two thousand dollars a program that will translate all of our forms and all of our um 
documents that are online into multiple languages. That's great, Jennifer. And I, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, however, part of the request for translations was to uh, for civic engagement, meaning town council meetings. There is a Zoom package that is available for translation. And I don't understand if I can get it through a university, if I can get it through different workshops I've attended, why is there such a lag in terms of town meetings that the, the very basic, I mean, I know we have multiple languages within uh, this town, thank goodness for the diversity, but the very, you know, it, when we look at the population uh, and, and the numbers, Spanish language, you know, why is that not available for town council meetings? And I, I understand you are working for the town, but this is just it. What's the accountability in terms of the town manager and the town council in getting translation services for town council meetings? Can someone please tell me and explain it to me? Well, I don't know that I can tell and explain what there is, but I will bring the, I will bring what you've just said, and I know you seem like that might not need to be set done, but I will bring what you've just said over to the town manager tomorrow, or as soon as I can when he's available, that, you know, the Zoom meetings can be translated, and that that's something that he, nice to be seen. That, that absolutely, like. absolutely yep. can be translated. And one thing having like all these town forms translated, that's awesome. I, I, I've seen that on other uh, town website, municipal websites where you simply, would you like this in Spanish? And would you like this in uh, Kamai, you know? So that can happen. And we did do that with the, so the senior center had a, a um, a survey that went out to different communities. And so we sent that survey out in English and Spanish. And then it came with a slip of paper that said if you needed it translated in other languages. And I know that they did do a couple of forms that last I knew that they were also available in Spanish as well. Like they offered an English one and then one in Spanish. I have no idea how well it was attended or um, any of the background information of about the different members who responded to the survey, but I know that that did go out because I did work on making sure that it was out in multiple languages. Great, I appreciate that. But we're talking about ongoing civic engagement so folks know what's going on and to see how relevant what is being said in town council is to their daily life. So, um, you know, we, we need, this is, this is CSSJC. This is what we are about. It's an equity issue. It's a social justice issue. That needs to happen like yesterday. So please bring, bring me an answer. I will be writing another letter, several letters, whatever needs to happen. But we, we really need to see that. Any discussion regarding translation from the members? I see Ms. Pat, then Deborah, then Philip. Ms. Pat? Oh, okay. So not specifically on translation, but my understanding is that it's money budgeted for this current fiscal year to address equity. Um, may I know what, you know, how we're going to spend that money? The reason why I asked this is that the town sponsor some events like Juneteenth. And it worries me that we will ask BIPOC restaurants, offer them like almost insulting amounts, sometimes to cater something or ask them to come and sell food. No, when we, the original two families who started Juneteenth in Amherst, for example, were the Shabazz and the Cage family. And they got food donated by Yuma, or so some people 
went there, it was a lot of fun. The one the time we also doing is a lot of fun. But people didn't have to worry about buying food because we, we are on hard times. Not everybody is upper middle class or middle class in this town. And when they started Juneteenth, it was free barbecue. You know, people, just a couple of people donated something there. It was fun. And it saddens me that those two families have been cut out in the planning of Juneteenth celebration. If we're talking about unity, we have to look at ourselves very well. We may not always agree with one another, but we need to pay respect. I come from a culture where we value history. We have such a short memory in our town that pioneers of certain projects get ignored. And that brings me to why on earth are we doing Juneteenth and we had to stop by Drake? What is the significance of that as well? So what yeah. I'm trying to say is the money that is set aside for equity, I would like it, you know, be spent part of it for Juneteenth coming next year. I would like it, you know, if we decide to do like Kwanzaa celebration and things like that. Um, I don't like the idea that people will go to the event and spend money. I'm sorry. It's not for commercialization. Thank you. Yeah, can I just respond to that first? So um, one is that we are working on a different way to uh, run Juneteenth, right? So that people don't have to pay for their meals. Um, I'm gonna say anything else about Juneteenth when it comes to conflict of people and people that you should just have a conversation with me when we're not online. And then three, um, I just wanna make sure that you're, the, the Juneteenth and the walk are, um, were two separate things. So while Juneteenth, we had the, and you know, part of the reason why having selling the food is so that the places can make some money too. But I do understand that it would be better for us to be able to purchase the food ahead of time and pay the businesses and then give them the food out for free. And we're working on that because I remember you saying that a couple of years ago or last year, and I haven't, we haven't been able to get quite there yet. So we are, we hear you, Pat, Miss Pat, and I'm working on it. And anything else, if you would like to talk to me about it, we can talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. You're doing a great job. I, I know it's very hard that, you know, we have a lot of work to do in this town and we appreciate you. You know, I mean, you're, you're one of the rocks in town. And I was the one who suggested that you be appointed assistant DI director. And CSWG, we have great faith in you. And we thank you for everything you do and you're all over the place. You know, this is not personal, but this is one of the ways of supporting the work that you do, the work that Dr. Pamela is doing, the work that Mr. All is doing. You know, our committee is here to support the work you guys are doing. Yep, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know that. Can, can you all hear me? Now we can. Yeah, I think my kids are on the on the internet. That's what Ooh, happens. So I know. Well, but I also told them the meeting was going to be done at eight. So okay, <laughs> we're trying. We're trying. So I think that's why they're like, I'm. I'm on the. Um, okay, we can hear you if you want to go ahead. Okay. Just. Oh, now we can't. I just, no, I just told them to the, not to stream. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. Thank you. So Two more minutes. Listen, all right. So really, really quickly, um, you know, in terms of the translation uh, services, just to add to it, um, you know, in, in talking with Paul Bachman would be to not all right. Deborah, we missed the meat of that. I can guarantee it. Yeah, just just go on to the next person. It's fine. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear what you have to say because I know you also belong to a particular language group, and again, it's wanting to get folks uh, civically engaged. So, Philip, yeah, I'm just speaking on language and access in general for 
uh, the Latinx community in particular, since you brought up statistics of our town and the majority of it. I think it goes beyond just simply translating something, right? And especially just using a Google form or a different type of organization. There's many different dialects within the Latino community and many different translations of that. And so community members reading it need to kind of know that someone there has their back. And I think that that's something in particular and why I step up a lot in a lot of um, town events for the Latinx community is that the Latinx community is kind of the unseen community in this town. And I think myself and probably another individual that I'm thinking of are Latino, Latinx people that step up in these positions as part of these committees, as part of these um, topics. And just having like meeting times, right? Like a lot of our Latino and Latinx folks work kind of not regular business hours. We work service industry jobs, which at a dime of a hat, you know, our day off is taken like that. And we're working 12 hour shifts, different things like that. So having meetings more accessible to individuals, I think is also important to highlight that. And just having people that speak Spanish or any other language on like town, hall town council would be great absolutely thank you Philip. oh what just happened uh, deborah if you want to email me what you wanted to say <laughs> okay let me I... try it one more time can you all hear me now yes all right let me try it one more time really quickly um, yeah, as you were saying, Dimitri, I am Cape Verde. I'm also not from this country. I'm originally from Cape Verde Islands, West Africa. So obviously translation services is very uh, dear to my heart. Um, so I was just saying in terms of making sure that um, the town offices also have, uh, besides documents, also having like um, ways to make sure that they're translating, that they have other languages for when people go to the offices, because that's very important. Because when people go to the offices and they have questions and things like that at the town hall, if they don't have it in different languages, it's going to be very difficult for them to really be able to engage. So I know that like the medical, um, you know, the hospitals, they have ways to, to always have translation services ready and, and, and able to do it, whether it's through the the internet, like calling different people that are on call to be able to, to translate into those different languages in all different languages, not just Spanish. Um, so those are some of the things that we need to start really looking into and making sure that there's, because we're in 2022, those things are available. So those are some of the things too that I want to ask Paul Bachman about, but obviously, uh, Jennifer, you can already start sharing these things with Paul Bachman because we need to make sure that every facet of the town hall services, meetings, offices, the work that that were spaces that town that that the town has has different um, uh, translation services ability to be able to translate into different languages. And in 2022, that is not difficult. I know it's going to cost some money, but it's not difficult to do. So what we need to do is make sure that that is part of the conversation and really brainstorming in terms of how to bring it bring it um, together. And then lastly, um, one of the uh, community members already brought this up, which was something we discussed in CSWG, which is around CREST. So Earl, this one is for you, is in terms of making sure that when, um, I know you all are in training, but yet and still, like I, I hope you all are already formulating a major marketing campaign, major outreach uh, campaign to let people know about Crest. And this needs to be in different languages. This cannot be in just um, you know you know English and that's it. And you need to outreach, go into different um, communities, elders within within those uh, communities where English is not the first language, where it's groups that are marginalized to let them know about Crest. If these folks don't know about Crest, then we know who's going to use Crest. It's going to be the status quo, the same groups that are going to use it. And the ones that actually need it won't know about it and won't be able to use it. So one of, some of the community members that talked to me, they were like, are they going to really kind of you know, market this, do a very, very like intense campaign. And I know CSWG had talked about that. 
Thank you, Deborah. Um, the other thing I want to mention pertaining to Crest and the other services at Town Hall is that um, you know recently there was a uh, the 988 hotline, I believe, for suicide that was released, and that there's um, it, it you know also Spanish language within that. So you know if you look through the BIPOC lens. The moment things are created policy wise and institutionally, you automatically begin to think of multiple languages and also how does this affect multiple ethnicities and races of people. Because if we're not looking through that lens, we're going to make mistakes and create a crest where, oh, there's no Spanish speakers, there's no Cape Verde, you know, Portuguese speakers. So we need to build that end from jump or at least have a plan in place to make sure those things are implemented because we don't wanna make the same mistakes and not be inclusive and diverse uh, like our world is from get-go. Because I know, you know, in terms of translations or when things hit with COVID, I have to give props. My neighbor, who's Peruvian, was the one that stepped up and called on the town manager and the Department of Health to do something about, you know, people who, you know, are immigrant communities, uh, Latinx communities, and issues around COVID and getting them to doctors and translation. That's not her job. She did it for free. So we need to also be in mind that this isn't a volunteer position. We have to hire someone, have that as their role and compensate them. Can I just so, ask Earl about the linguistic capacity of the current responders that have been hired? Uh, yeah, we have a uh, Spanish speaker, Swahili speaker, a uh, person who speaks Kenyan, great folks. Um, a quarter of our folks uh, speak fluently or culturally, uh, other speak other languages and we have a, a couple other folks on our team who uh, have learned languages through college and are able to speak some conversational Spanish uh, where we're working on uh, language access interpreter programs that 988 system I was a part of developing the front door for behavioral health in the Commonwealth so um, uh, two pieces I, I, I would not be so certain that those language resources are, are, are available today um, and we're, we're doing our best and really you know we we wanted a diverse team language as a part of that we're obviously not going to cover every language but we're doing our best to outreach to every community and and ideally hopefully uh hire folks from some of the communities that have not been a part of public safety historically uh particularly some of the folks from uh who speak uh asian dialects we've heard from folks that it's challenging when they don't hear anybody who can speak their language so we're looking and if you know folks who you think might might want to join the team we're always interested in in having that conversation with them before there's an opening so they can think about it so from kenya you're saying kiyu kiyu or what are you what are they speaking uh i i know what he told me i i know what he told me he's a he's he was native born in kenya okay yeah all right okay so great that is good to know that there are so many uh languages that are available all right so we went through uh translation youth empowerment resident oversight did folks have questions about that although miss young uh dr young did talk a little bit about it we have a timeline that we're satisfied with yeah i i just want to make sure that um because that was something you know along with ross that was something that i was um very interested in uh making sure that it was um you know, just that is, it gets brought up very, um, you know, well done, that it, it's useful to the community, to the BIPOC community, and that obviously it, it, the BIPOC um, population is very much, you know, part of it. We were very um, clear in terms of that, you know, CSWG, I know there's laws, I know there's going to be the union aspect, but we, we definitely want all of those things to kind of be paid attention to. Um, so anything that you you need in terms of like talking to us from CSWG in regards to oversight res resident board, because that's something that we do want up and running um, as soon as possible, but also done well uh, so that then it's actually a place where uh, people can go. Right. Because right now people are very afraid 
a retaliation, very afraid that nothing is going to happen if they file complaints at the at the APD. So they want to make sure that this place is an avenue that they can actually really use. So I um, actually had a conversation with the HR director today because both of the police department union contracts are up for collective bargaining this year to see what efforts have been made to, um, for them to comply with initially the the post the new statewide legislation which would mirror in many ways some of the things that you that are suggested through the through the report and in my conversation with the hr director um, i've been told that the uh, police department would be fully in compliance so my understanding of the legislation is that um, uh, basically, police departments over a three-year rotation cycle are complying with the new training and accreditation for police officers. Um, and it's my understanding that that the police department is fully or would be fully in compliance when all of when it's their turn to go to submit their paperwork. But certainly, I think from my perspective, one of the largest challenges will be the collective bargaining aspect of it. And if um, it uh, if we miss our opportunity to collectively bargain for some of the aspects uh, uh, of the recommendation this year, then you know it's gonna be two years before there's there's an opportunity. And I, I mean I when I read over the when I you know looked over the collective bargaining agreement, looked at the recommendations that are that were made, um, I would say my opinion would be, uh, and this is, uh, you know, a, an opinion that's still being formed, probably the most important thing I would argue for would be to, uh, to bargain, a, a, for the town to bargain away the one year, um, uh, I guess, termination of, of disciplinary records, right? So after one year, they're, they're wiped away. So if there was anything that would probably be uh, critical to what some of the efforts that you wanted to to really see happen, that would be the number one on my list. But as I said, you know, I um, have just beginning to to really read through all those documents, look at the collective bargaining agreement, read the uh, state legislature on this issue, and try to put together what I think would be a realistic timeline. Um, for implementation, but a, a critical piece is going to be collective bargaining because without that, there's no authority to to do some of the things that um, you know that you've outlined that you want to achieve. Absolutely, and we included studies, and of course, Leap also had some of that information. There's mm -hmm. there's lots of models, right. and again, as a network, we we have access to that. Miss Pat. So um, what I wanted to say is, Dr. Pamela, I see you uh, working on creating the resident oversight board. So please keep in mind um, compensations for the members. It's very critical that they get compensated well. As a businesswoman myself, I feel that people's time is valuable, people's skills is valuable, and therefore they need to be compensated. In fact, Dr. Shabazz is the one that made comment a couple of years ago during uh, COVID and pushed for having committees members being compensated. That way, that's the way you're able to recruit diverse people. Because let's face it, not everybody's wealthy in this town. We have people who have young children who have good ideas. And if they don't get compensated, they can't pay for childcare. People sometimes long meetings, they need to, maybe it will be at night that they don't, you know, they don't have to cook and so on and so forth. So, so look into that because it will really influence, you know, people that will apply. And we don't want the usual suspect to apply for that. I would like to see a robust majority BIPOC panelists on the resident oversight board. That's all I want to say. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Pat. I mean, we, we look at larger municipalities, I understand they're larger, but more diverse municipalities. That is a given that there is a stipend because when you want diverse voices, not just the retired, not just the wealthy, who can afford to allot their time to participate and engage civically, a stipend can sometimes help and motivate people to participate in their communities. The model of government in this town, let's face it, is based on you know, a 200 year old system where people who were wealthy, people who were retired and had the leisure time to shape town government. Yep. That is no longer who lives here though we know there are many who are still in place trying to push for that agenda, we're, we're not gonna let them. So to have more diverse voices, to have more people participate, some encouragement through a stipend childcare, um, I think would bring a much more diverse, as, as Ms. Pat says, robust pool of people. It is 829. Um, I know uh, you have something to say, Earl, but I, I just want to remind ourselves that we were gone 30 minutes over in, in good conversation, but at some point we do have to, to close it out. No, I was just going to say I actually have to go. I started at seven this morning and if I'm losing my sense of time. So I appreciate being here with you all and I look forward to continued conversation with you all. Thank you, Earl. You well. Can I just ask, oh, Jen, and then... If nobody else has. I, I just wanted to say since we're talking about stipends and that you I will be sending out new hire packets for everyone to complete for their stipends as this one is a group that is to be stipend it's Great. in the charge thanks for for remembering any other comments or questions I did want to circle back to the video for one second, if that's yeah. okay. And I just wanted to ask this group if we wanted to take some sort of action together as the new CSSJC, although the CSWG has already put out a statement, if, if that is something that we think we should do as a group together, um, and then what the process would be if, if that was the case, since we wouldn't be meeting again for another month or so. Thank you, Allegra. I think it's important. Um, uh, obviously, I, I've already uh, spoke about it. I'd like to hear um, Philip and Dr. Eke um, what your feelings are about it, since all of us have, have voiced our uh, ideas. I think that it's totally important to address and to have this group and possibly even other groups, um, BIPOC groups to speak out on it, especially if it's going to get swept under the rug by town officials or higher up um, people. I will say that being a part of the Human Rights Commission, I know that that's on our agenda as well. So if we wanted to team up in that way, I can almost guarantee that we can. Good to know. Dr. Ake? Yeah, my feelings remain the same. Um, I had mentioned that I just saw it this evening, and so um, I wouldn't be in a position to have a statement, which, however, doesn't mean that the committee um, can't have something to say. It, it would only mean that I would abstain from whatever position the committee has. So you have no problem that if we wrote a statement as a committee, uh, just not to include your name? Yes, that'd be fine or to include it, but not that I abstained. And um, so perhaps if there's a question asked about that, then I could explain again that uh, um, I was coming to this video late um, compared to everyone else. And I would want to speak to a few other people to have a better sense um, of um, perhaps from the town council, some members um, and um, others to know um, exactly um, the silence and other reasons why things have not been said, but I wouldn't want to um, say anything at the moment without further information. Okay, so that's fair, except that uh, we wouldn't necessarily 
we, we wouldn't have to make a statement about the silence of the town council. We would um, possibly, and it's up to the committee, to make a statement regarding the video and the police treatment, which you did see. Yeah, I did see, but um, so part of my work as a um, political scientist, and this is what I tell my students is to um, look at as much information as, as is needed um, before coming to a conclusion on your position. And um, I think I would want to do the same in this situation. I have seen the video, but I would need to get my information before taking a position. Yeah, I'm not pressuring you to take a position, but I'm, I'm saying that we could possibly do a statement and just not include your name. Oh, that's fine. If I may. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Pat. Okay, I get what Dr. Uh, Fick is saying. You know, he's new in, the, in town. He hasn't seen the video. I respect all that. I am wondering, and I know we're all busy, can we possibly meet in two weeks or even next week? Because, because of open meeting law, I don't know how we're going to do the statement and not communicate you know, through emails. I think um, it's something we need to consider. Maybe have a special meeting for an hour or something, have somebody draft something. But I'm wondering how logistically, how we can all agree on the statement without us having open meeting. That way we are not accused of you know, violating open meeting law. I feel very strongly that our group should, should come up with very strong public statement. And um, hopefully the town uh, will come up with their response and the outcome of the review that this is the top priority for me right now. I can't speak for everyone. I, I will push my schedule around if people are available uh, for us to meet, even on weekend, that we have to post it, you know, for the eight hours prior. And I know this, this might be a time burden for our staff, um, but I, I will support for us to do public statement. And my understanding with committees is majority rules. So I don't expect in some of our deliberation and decision for everybody to agree on everything. So even if you know one person drops, doesn't want to be part of it, that's okay. Majority, you know, will still go along with it. That's all I want to say. So I'd be interested in, in that, Ms. Pat. It sounds like Jennifer would have to post the, the meeting. And um, would we be able to begin uh, some outline or draft, maybe have a volunteer, or it would probably have to be about two of us to volunteer to do that, or would it be just be one? We can do what CSWG did. You know, we had subcommittees. You know, we can have two people, you know, come up with drafts that we can take a look at when we have our special meeting for an hour. And so if there are two people that do it, that is not a quorum, so that doesn't violate exactly. the open meeting law? Yes, yeah. but let's not call them subcommittees because subcommittees are Sorry. held to okay. quorum, yes. are held. So okay. I would not mind volunteering to put something together um, if... Yeah, so can I just suggest that if two of you are going to put something together and work on it that you guys do that and then present that is that what I'm understanding on at the meeting and then you guys vote whether or not that you want to send that out yes right at the meeting we would then vote to yep. if we wanted to send it out the meeting yes so and, any mm -hmm. volunteer with Allegra no volunteers to do the draft I mean, I don't mind helping uh, Allegra. I was just hoping uh, to get some more involvement. <laughs> I know folks are busy, um, but we can certainly, uh, the two co-chairs work on the draft. 
And then if you, so if the meeting is, for instance, is going to be next Thursday, right? And then if you are able to have the draft done by Tuesday, we can send that out to the group. They just can't respond. And that way they can have already read it and have their ideas to share, which might help it move a little bit smoother when you're working with a, you know, a larger group. Absolutely. So are we in agreement? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, we're in agreement as long as we, we keep the time to an hour and yes, yeah, send the draft beforehand because yeah, unfortunately I am super, super busy right now. I, I thought can't. summer was gonna be, summer was gonna be nice and easy and it has turned out to be otherwise. So. <laughs> Sorry, Deb. <laughs> Okay, so we're in agreement. Um, anything else? Well, can we decide a, a day next week? Oh, I thought we did. I'm so. Did you? Sorry. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Does oh. is Thursday good for people? Any day is good for me. Thursday next week is the twenty eighth. I don't. Know. <laughs> yes, it is the twenty eighth. Is that going to work for folks? Yeah, that'll work for me. Are we at six o'clock again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Wow. Can't believe we came to agreement. Oh, something. Super easy. <laughs> and let's, like you say, Deb, let's keep it to, to an hour. So it's important that folks read over the draft and that we meet together, uh, talk about things that need to be changed, add it, whatever, and vote on it. Please do not respond to. I know. Don't respond. No, I'm please, saying you're in not the you in particular. Just oh. the group, because sometimes people hit reply all. Right. And then, and that's what we can't have happen. We will respond during the meeting. Yeah. But but you will send a draft. Let's say just so I can look out for it on the 26th by like I don't know what eight o'clock or something, just so I can look out for it in my email. Sounds good to me. Yeah, you're talking to Allegra and I. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That would be, okay, just so we can all kind of pay attention so we look at our email. <laughs> so we can come prepared to the meeting on Thursday. Yep. Yay. Yeah. So trust me, um, Deborah was our unofficial editor. Yeah. <laughs> so I you know, send stuff to her in advance. Otherwise, we are going to table it. <laughs> okay, got you. All right. In okay. advance. <laughs> all right, so any other comments, upcoming agenda items, other topics? It sounds like for upcoming agenda items, real quick, we're going to have hopefully a fuller implementation report. We will discuss CSWG, LEAP report, et cetera, particularly with the town manager to see what um, has uh, happened, uh, what has been left out, what still needs to happen. Um, I guess we will have a Crest Department report, which we didn't have um, necessarily. Anything else for the yes. agenda? No, yes. That's not for next week. That's for the yep. large meeting. I do. I had requested, I had the requested for list of contractors and consultants yes. to the town identified by race. Absolutely. And also, um, I would like to have um, a comprehensive um, allocation of APA funds because the federal stimulus money was supposed to go to people hardest hit by pandemic. Right. And we have chunk of money that was given to um, bid to distribute to local businesses. I think it's the wrong thing to do. I think, um, the town should have admitted it directly. And BID is hiring a staff person, I think development director or something like that. So I need to see, you know, how we're spending the share of upper fund for Amherst in our next meeting. Or if the finance director can come, that would be great. One of, one of the things I hope I will be doing in this committee is to continue for us to be aware, follow the money. I'm a businesswoman, follow the money in this town. Money talks, money is power. Who are benefiting from the money? Right. That will be my role here more than anything else. 
Well, Ms. Pat, with that, um, if we could get a sense of there is new state funding that has been allocated uh, for small businesses as of, I think, last week that passed. So there's, there's another infusion of state money due to COVID uh, challenges for small businesses. Who's going to administer that? And where is that going? Okay. Comments, questions? Um, I just want to say that the, the items that are listed as updates are standard items on the agenda. So I oh. just assume that you guys will want an update every time we meet with them. Great. And if I can have the co-chair stay on for just two minutes afterwards. Okay. And, just to, and just to make sure in the end, implementation report that we have a report around ADMA and YSAT. Yeah, yes. Okay. So, but just to be clear, so that, that they don't think it's just implementation, we want the, the ADMA and YSAT. And right. obviously very critical for Paul Bachman to be at the next meeting. Absolutely. And the two implementation uh, people that were hired, um, Wilson uh, Darman and Abdullah, Galayimi. So you want asking, them to attend? No, but I'd like oh. for them to be included in the report. Oh, yeah. So and the if, last thing, the last thing I have, I'm sorry. Sorry, just real quick. And if Paul needs to have the budget person there, because we're going to be asking him questions around the budget too, it's fine. He wants to have Sean there, right, Sean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question I have, I know our town have social services program, like if somebody needs help with, you know, rent or something like that. So my understanding is that we contracted it out to a white led organization in Franklin County. I'm not going to mention it. So I want to know what the status of that. It needs to come back. It is back. It it's at the family it center. Administered by our town. The reason why I said that there were a couple BIPOC, non-speaking um, English, okay, who tried to access that fund during pandemic. They lost their job, everything. They couldn't get it because that agency could not help them with language barrier. barrier. So I don't want any resident to have to go to any contracted, white-led contracted agency for help, for childcare voucher or housing voucher. I want it in-house and that's why we pushed, CSWG pushed for DEI department. Thank you. In fact, that's what the bicultural center was supposed to do, where, where BIPOC families can go to get help that they need. That's part of the function of that center, among other things. Right. Okay, so more to talk about. That's a good thing. Um, but we do need to close out the meeting. So if we could have a motion uh, to adjourn. I have a question. When do we meet in August? That's a good question. When's our next meeting in August? We want to keep it consistent every Tuesday, every third Tuesday of each month. Would that work for people for fall schedule? Yeah, that would be good. That it's would the be the issue would be the August week. I'm out of town, but the 16th. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, so Allegra, you're out of town. Is anyone else out of town on the 16th? No. Can we do a week before then, Allegra? Well, the week before then, I'm out of town. So <laughs> oh, okay. Be, it would have to be the week after, the 23rd. I'm, okay, I'm, how I'm, does that sound for everybody? Good. Works for me. Good for me. 23rd? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Okay, nice. At six, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ekete, for that question. Very important. <laughs> All right. So can we make a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Okay. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and we're See supposed to stay on. Okay, so stay on, Allegra. Yes, yeah. staying on. See you.